Hello, and welcome to the Voices in Montessori podcast, brought to you by the Greenspring Center for Lifelong Learning. As Dr. Montessori tells us, an education capable of saving humanity is no small undertaking. We agree. So let's get to work. I'm Tamara Sheasley Vallis, and in today's episode, we're talking about the impact of playfulness in the elementary classroom. My guest today is Jody Trim. Jody is taught at the three to six and six to nine levels and served as a division head. This fall, she will begin her tenure at Brooklyn Heights Montessori School as the head of the elementary program. Jody is also an instructor and field consultant at Montessori Elementary Teacher Training Collaborative in Lexington, Massachusetts, and an elementary faculty member of the Westside Montessori School Teacher Education Program in New York City, where she helped develop the Lower Elementary Teacher Training Course. She holds a BS in education and an MED. She also holds Lower Elementary Training and Upper Elementary Training Montessori credentials. Welcome, Jody. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm so looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, me too. Yeah, so we're here to talk about playfulness, which when when we started talking about this topic, I have to share with you that I feel like it can really be missing because we take this work so seriously. We are our guides, our assistants, we care so much about the children and what they're learning and how they're growing. And it's easy to get swept away from being playful in our classrooms. And so I, I would love you to talk about how playfulness is essential to the classroom experience and what, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think playfulness and you're right. I totally agree with you. <laughs> it is a very, a, a very serious business being a teacher. It is. Um, it is. Yeah. Day in, day out, like there are so many things to do. <clears throat> Playfulness is not necessarily on the top of your list when you arrive at school at 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, it's a feeling. It's like a feeling that a classroom or a teacher has. And I think we know it when, when we're in it. You know, if you take a moment and imagine like your worst classroom experience, like mm -hmm. early years, like one to five, one to six. Like As a child, you mean? Yes. Yes. As a child, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like imagine that teacher or whoever it was that was like leading that classroom and like what they were like, mm. like you, was there, you know, was there any playfulness there? Like, were they fun? Like, were they funny in, in any way? Like you don't get that warm kind of connected feeling and contrast that with now, like imagine your favorite teacher or like your best classroom that you had in your elementary years, mm -hmm. like that adult that was there. Mm -hmm. I've got, They're, I have both of them. I want you to know I've got the yeah. images. I think we, we all do. Mm -hmm. um, and when you think about that teacher that was part of that, like really good classroom experience and you ask kids, like, who's your favorite teacher? And why they say, well, they were fun. They were fun. They were fun, you know, or they say they were nice or, or one or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean there was like one, like a one-off class party or like a really great celebration one day. It like fun is the everyday small interactions, like the infused playfulness mm. that's in a classroom. So that's what I mean when I say sort of like playfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. And so when you're talking about a teacher being playful, what would you say the qualities that he or she or they need to have to really bring to be somebody who's playful? So I, I think it it's like a sense of lightness mm -hmm. and a sense of humor and sort of this like purposeful joy in the things that you do. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean playing, you know, it could, it could mean playing with a mm. child play, or playing with your class, but it's, it's in the everyday, all day moments. It's like a way of seeing the world, a lens you can kind of look through. Mm -hmm. Mm. I mean, it can be a single event. Like it definitely can be, and kids will absolutely love that. I mean, 
another teacher and I, at the end of last year, we had this fundraising event and all the teachers, you know, they, they donate something and the parents, you know, sign their kids up for it. So we did this drench your teacher event and we had sold out twice. <laughs> so the, the kids, they come that it's me and this, uh, this other teacher and they have five gallon pails of water. And then those big water syringes, you know, that you kind of fill up and then spray. Yeah. And, and a bunch of water balloons and it was like absolute bliss for them. Like they got to team up against their teachers, drench us with water for as long as it it took, which unbelievably was like 30 minutes, a lot longer than I thought it was going to take, but it was like a dream come true, you know? Mm -hmm. So it can be like that Mm -hmm. one off, but, um, it's, it's more, and it's mostly not that kind of thing. It's mostly how we are in the small interactions, like in our lessons, Mm. Yes. And then, you know, at lunch, on the bus, on a field trip, like walking somewhere where, where all these other like little things happen with kids that are not formal. Mm-hmm. 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 And is there, so I think people often associate being playful with early education. They, I, I know in Montessori, we take that very seriously, but oftentimes there's a concept of play, which should be present, obviously, in early ed. Yet when children get into elementary, it feels more serious, more significant for some reason. So why why be so intentional about play in elementary? Well, I mean, in Montessori, we think about, you know, the first plane as zero to six and the second plane, six to 12 years old. So elementary school. And they're changing really quickly when they come into first grade as they move into that second plane. So they're going from being these concrete thinkers to abstract thinkers. Mm -hmm. And that includes the development of this sense of humor, which is very abstract. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. They're suddenly into making friends in a different way, like real friendships, not kind of like the parallel friendships that you might, that you do see in the three to six classroom, but it, a stronger bonded friendship. Um, They don't need us anymore to meet their adults, to meet their physical needs. They needed to feel connected like in a different way to us. So they don't just sort of blindly admire like they do their primary teachers or adults when they're younger, but they connect with us when they feel understood and like loved by us. Um, And playfulness is at the center of all those things. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. you know take connecting to peers for example they need to build a social life suddenly when they come to elementary school and that's centered around play and humor Mm. so I mean just take for example a joke like the corniest joke which this was last week this joke was kind of floating around and I heard it uh which was like (laughs) why why do you never play games with a cheetah because all cheetahs are cheetahs you know, ridiculous, like <laughs> popsicle stick joke, you know, if you tell that to a lower elementary student, they'll just tell it to the next person they see and the next person they see and the next person they see, like whether or not they're friends, they, they can't help it. They just have this urge. So by the end of the day, half the class will know the joke. And then like the next day, all the other kids from the next classroom over are coming to you, telling you the joke. So it's all those unlikely connections that were fostered by this like tiny little joke that are so important for these elementary age kids. I mean, they they can't help it. Like the younger kids, they're like obsessively sponging children's house kids or like um, washing or washing their hands, you know, again and again, that repetitive behavior for elementary, that's just humor. They can't, mm-hmm. they'll take the bait. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love thinking about that. I I have to tell you, I haven't really ever thought of it and framed it that way. But what you're really saying is that that play and that humor is really the foundation for their developing peer relationships. Yeah. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you can set up, yes, yeah. You can set up a, a book bin in your classroom of joke books. You don't have to say anything at yeah. all. Mm-hmm. Somebody will find it. And before you know it, there's like four kids around that book bin reading the jokes to each other, 
connecting with each other, being social with each other, practicing reading facial expressions, practicing reading tone of voice, practicing okay. reading. I mean, and they, for them, they're doing it because they just want to connect and form friendships. And then for us, you know, the, the benefit is they're doing all the things we want them to learn to do in the elementary years. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And I love having the guide be a role model because the truth is that playfulness is a key to having a fulfilled life. Yeah. I mean, adults can become so significant and so busy and so serious that we forget play. And there's so much out there. There's so much research on how laughter is this key to our health and well being as human beings? And I had not considered how intentional we need to be in an elementary classroom to really seed and fuel that. Mm -hmm. That's I I I love this conversation. Love this conversation. Yeah, they we forget they literally don't know how. Like they don't know how to tie their shoes and they don't know how to um organize a folder they also don't really know how to joke yet but they're dying to know they don't really know how to be playful but dying to know so yeah teacher as the role model the adult as the role model is so important it's interesting because this year at the end of the year our, our staff got together and we were talking about finishing strong and what does that look like and one of our lower l guides said how about we we have a joke a day and so the staff has been actually like filming themselves telling a joke or one of them created a meme about some, and it really is bringing this joy and levity to the end of the year for us as adults too. Yeah. And they're all, they're all like corny kid jokes, which is perfect. Right. So we can actually take them into our classrooms too, but it's just, it really is um, part of our responsibility with the whole child is helping them learn this skill of, of playfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. And some of them may have be in homes where there's not so much play, right? There's mm -hmm. so, so that's, that's really interesting. Okay. Okay. So keep going, keep going. <laughs> well, I mean, speaking of your, your guides over at Greenspring making up jokes, I mean, the kind of relationship that, that, elementary kids need with their teacher. I mean, that bond they need with their teacher laughing together is mm -hmm. one of the ways to do that. You know, it's like, it's the only way mm -hmm. I think to one of the, one of the few ways I'll say to connect with children so that they, you know, do what you want them to do or open up or be vulnerable when you, when you want them to be, or, you know, when they've made a mistake with a friend made a social blunder, which happens like all day, every day in elementary <laughs> to, to connect with them and, and sort of coach them through that. They need to be bonded with you mm -hmm. and that bond, which, mm -hmm. you know, can be formed through being playful and laughing together um, is the foundation of classroom management. Mm -hmm. and you, you can have all the systems and procedures and like job chart and lineup order and all of that, the bell and teach them all of it. But if they're not, um, if they don't buy into it, mm -hmm. it won't work. And the mm -hmm. buying comes from them being bonded with you. And the bond comes from you being playful and laughing together with them. You know? mm. So it's really what you're saying is it's foundational. Mm -hmm. And if you are not bringing play into your elementary classroom, then what? Then, you know, not only is it probably boring <laughs> for them, which is like, I mean, boredom is like the first thing that will derail your classroom management. Um, but they're, the kids start to like almost work against you a little bit because mm -hmm. they have no, like, they, they have no reason, you know, like in, in zero to, or three to six, let's say, there's this kind of admiration for the teacher that, well, the teacher is like the teacher. They're like almost perfect you know, and then they come right. to elementary and like, we're flawed and they know it. So there has to be another reason for them to sort of in, to engage with what you're asking them to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. Okay. So let's talk about how this translates into real life in the classroom day, day to day. 
-hmm. where do you start by bringing, let's say you're somebody who hasn't had a lot of attention on play. I didn't, I naturally am a pretty playful person, but I wasn't conscious. It wasn't like I learned in training that I needed to bring, bring real play into the classroom. Um, so that's maybe it's not something you've done a lot of, or you haven't had a lot of attention on it. Where, where do you start? So I think one, one place to start, I can think of two big ones, but one place to start, um, is, is um, like a practice of mindfulness. I mean, we, we talk about mindfulness all the time now in education. Um, and I think in elementary classrooms, mindfulness can be and help you create like that moment before you respond mm. to whatever it is. And, you know, elementary classrooms are sometimes disaster zones of just everyone's everywhere doing everything. Like you can respond that the, the busy teacher will start to respond with this sort of directive, corrective language, mm -hmm. realizing it like all over the place to sort of put out the fires of the classroom, but instead you use mindfulness to just isolate that moment and think, could I use playfulness right now? Could I use something lighter right now? Mm. It will change the tone of your response, which will change the entire like psychological environment of the classroom. So, you know, so much happens every day we expect these things to happen every day. So like think the kid who drops the pumpkin pulp is everywhere. The kid who's like overwatering a plant, water's spilling out everywhere. The bumping the head on the locker, the tripping over the rug, the, the just the chaos. Um, if you watch, usually the lesson that you want to be learned from like the dropping of the pumpkin, it scatters, you know, pulp everywhere. It's already been learned. You can see it on their face. They realize like, oh, I was just carrying it, you know, this way and I was kind of goofing around and I dropped it. So you can let the moment be mm -hmm. just for a moment. So they've got it, they get what happened. And then you can be playful about cleaning it, cleaning the, the pumpkin up, you know, like just a little ew, the look on your face. And then like you hand the, the towels over. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of another example of a few weeks ago, I was on an overnight with lower and upper elementary and we cooked together for the, the two days and I was on the breakfast team. So in the morning, it's like six in the morning and I'm with eight elementary kids in this big kitchen. And there's a few of them at the stove. We're making pancakes. We made like 150 pancakes that morning and they are starting to goof around a little bit. And a lot of pancakes. I just have to say, yeah. like, well, there was a uh, 35 of us. Wow. So it was a lot of pancakes. Yeah. They start to kind of goof around and um, one of the fifth graders, she flips the pancake, it flips onto the floor. And there's that moment where she looks at me like she knows now, she knows she was goofing around. Yeah. She shouldn't have been goofing around. Like we already talked about the hot stove, all that. So you just let it sit instead of responding, let her feel her feelings. And then, you know, I say like, it never happened. And like hand her a paper towel and it goes into the garbage. Like those moments, are where you can bring levity to the situation. Yeah. Okay. So hold on. Before you go on, I want to ask a question because I yeah. think this is an important distinction. So you have somebody who's being super goofy, mm -hmm. doing something that could be dangerous, right? If they're goofy around it, yet you've infused so much play. So what's that balance? Like, how do you support the child? In the classroom, I think, I mean, I, when I first started teaching, I taught conventional education and teach for America first. Mm -hmm. And we took this training and I mean, really they were, they said, you do not want to smile until December kind of thing, right? Like it was, and I will say that when I, and this was not a Montessori classroom, but when I got playful or they could not hold themselves, they, you know, they, it was, it was so big. So maybe it's not a fair comparison, but I know some people are going to have that experience where when they start to bring play and levity, mm -hmm. do, do you understand my question? Yeah. I mean, I think you're right that we have in Montessori classrooms, or you make, you make a good point in Montessori classrooms, you have kids for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So 
with your older kids, they already know you and they already, you've already worked with them. They understand your, your, how to read your energy and your facial expression and your tone of voice. But at first, if you're just, you know, new to the classroom, you know, none of the kids or the kids are, the, the first graders are new and coming. And I think you, this all kind of folds into teaching self-regulation mm, mm -hmm. and it's part of what we teach for self-regulation. I think initially we think of self-regulation as like when the child is upset, how do you teach them or what do you teach them to calm down? Mm -hmm. The feeling of like the silliness that's in elementary kids, that's also self-regulation. Like, what do I do when I feel too silly? Mm -hmm. so I think you, you can teach it directly. So, you know, set children up, for example, when you know you're going to do something funny, the pancake, you know, story that was like on the fly, but if you know you're going to come in and something you're going to do, some experiment or some story you're going to tell is going to make them laugh you can tell them, prepare them. Like, guys, I had the best weekend. Like, you won't believe what happened. It's so funny. I want to tell you the story, but I know after this, we have to go into lessons and work time. So I don't know, will you be able to like calm down after a couple minutes or maybe we should wait till recess. Like, let's just wait. And then they'll be begging you, you know, like, no, tell us, like, tell us the story. So now you have them, you know, and then you can kind of prep them. Okay, I'm going to tell you. And then we're going to laugh. But after a minute or two, like I'm going to put on kind of like my serious face again. And then we're going to settle down. And when you feel calm, like look at me, make eye contact, and then you can go and choose your work. So you've like prepared them for what's coming. Mm -hmm. them, you're going to give them a cue with your face of when, when we're settling down and then what to do next. And then like, give me a thumbs up when you think you're ready. And then they, they all will. Mm -hmm. And they'll all say they can totally do it. And then there's going to be a few kids who can't. They just, they think they can, they mean to, but they can't. So you can plan for that. Knowing mm -hmm. it's going to be a little handful that will need you to sit there and like co-regulate with them. Tell mm -hmm. them, talk to them about something else to kind of bring them back down. And then when they are, mm -hmm. you can use touch. It's like, this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like to come down from being, from, from, laughing really hard together that's you right it, you know and they're like oh I do feel it you know and then they they go off and you have to do that over and over again I love that lesson though right because we don't want to avoid joy and playfulness and fun just because afterwards and it is we do in life we have to learn how to regulate ourselves mm -hmm. so I love that example of having really supporting them in that process because it's self-discipline that you're supporting them in navigating and knowing how to be a person in the world who gets to have joy and play and then move into other things as well. That's great. That's great. I think it comes back to like, you know, the idea that they don't mean to stay you know, dysregulated. They don't mean to stay up here. They really don't know how to come down. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you can, just like they don't mean to misbehave, or they don't mean to hurt their friends, you know, none of those things are on purpose. Mm -hmm. So if you have that lens of like, they just don't know how, how can I show them? It mm -hmm. will change the way at least that we feel about them not being able to settle down and make us more empathetic and able to like meet them where they are. Especially because you're expecting it. Yeah. Right. Plan I, <laughs> we're planning for it, right? That That's the thing. We know this is going to happen. So it doesn't mean we take away the joy so we avoid it, right? That I think is often that what people do is they just avoid it. I certainly did not have those skills when I started teaching. And so what a gift. Okay. So do you have any other examples for us of times that you have brought play into the classroom that that because I know folks love real everyday life examples uh yeah I mean I I can I have so many <laughs> I could talk forever about it but I mean I I think the the sort of on the fly ones like the the pancake for example um or the there's the 
another, they're always goofing around in elementary, like I, and in the best way, but you know, one day they, they're goofing around, they dropped, let me go back. We had so many pets in my classroom after I had been in there for like four or five years, just so many that we were having crickets come in every day or every other day. And the kids were, they designed these like cricket houses and they'd bring them to pet smart or pet co and bring crickets in and one morning they're kind of you know goofing around and the top slides off and like probably 50 crickets just go in every direction oh. in the classroom it's like dropping the uh test tubes the for long division every direction and there's that moment where we can be teachers can we set the tone for what's happening you know and it was like let it sit let the one who dropped it and the three who are goofing around like have that moment where they're just like, oh, I made a mistake. This was so bad. And then we're like, it's May 10th, you know, 2008, the day the crickets finally escaped. <laughs> There's like a moment. And then <laughs> I just reached down, I grabbed the cricket and like threw it in the lizard tank. And then they all did the same thing. You oh, know, that lizard was very happy that day. So overfed. <laughs> but they'll follow your lead on it, you know? Yeah. yeah. And you're teaching them how to respond when life doesn't go exactly their way. And life does not always go exactly their way. And that's such an important life skill. I, I love that requirement almost for you as a lead guide or as a classroom assistant that you're going to choose play and your own uh, it's almost choosing peace in the moment rather than going that make wrong that we can go to right because we never blame the child right if if they're struggling we're going to look and see what the unmet need is so this is not an this is the same same frame right we're bringing that frame they're not in trouble because the lid popped off how do we handle it in life when something goes wrong? So I love that. Love that. Love that. Yeah. And it just becomes a habit then. Like at first you have to do this intentionally, but then yeah. it just becomes like, this is how I am. You know, you build a muscle. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we may have to build it for ourselves. Yeah, you right. do. I mean, some people are just naturally, they grew up in homes or, you know, their disposition that they're just naturally more playful and it comes easier and others not, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you had talked about kind of taking your lesson and having it be more serious, but I'm, I'm also assuming you have play built into your lessons. Do yeah, you want to talk about that kind of frame? Yeah. So there's, you know, there's the day-to-day, -day, you can't predict it moments that you, you try to use humor in and practice doing that, but then there's your lesson planning. And you can intentionally plan for humor, playfulness, joking around in your lessons. And, you know, we, we know now that science has proven that, you know, just laughing, like decreases anxiety, decreases boredom, increases comprehension, increases satisfaction with learning, all those things we know uh -huh. but are, you know, it doesn't just happen. You can look at your weekly lesson plan. Uh -huh. I think I a lot of Montessorians plan like, you know, by the week for the week before sure. or even the day before and look at what you have planned and just ask, like, is there, where is the playfulness? Like you can start small, like which lesson has some playfulness in it? Like, or which lesson will, in which lesson will they laugh today? And if there's like no lessons where you've planned something to make them laugh, I mean, come on. <laughs> pick one, pick one, you know, and there's, I think once you get started, just like the habit of reacting with playfulness, it becomes easier to do, but I can think of some, you know, off the top of my head, every other year or so we do like a mystery unit in lower elementary at our school. And on that morning, the teachers get together and we like take all the markers or all the pencils like out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. So they arrive, you know, regular morning, they don't notice right away, but eventually as they start their morning, 
they know like there's no pencils and there's just like general buzz like where's the pencils you know and they're like looking around and then you're there and you, we put a spoon there in the area and then you kind of go over and you're like well, I don't know like there's a spoon here maybe they're in the kitchen I don't know, you know, and then they're like, what? <laughs> and they're like a little confused, which is funny for them. And they go down to the kitchen and they're asking the the chef down there, like, have you seen the pencils? And, you know, she reveals, cause you've set this up, like that there's a screw or something. And they're like a screw. Oh, maybe it's facilities. They're over in the facilities, like talking to the head of facilities mm-hmm. because they found a screw in the kitchen about, you know, and they follow this sort of treasure hunt, which is so fun for them. I mean, they, they can't believe the markers are missing. They do believe they're actually missing and they kind of go through the school, they collaborate, they problem solve, they laugh. It's funny for them. And then when they find them and realize you actually hid them, which they, takes them longer than you would think. I mean, the whole thing is just playful and it gets their brains primed mm. to start this, this mystery reading, you know, unit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love that. And it also requires that you are bringing a lens of playfulness to everything you're doing. So, okay. So that makes sense for literature. Can you tell me how you have brought play or humor say to a science lesson? Yeah. So I think kids at the elementary age, things that are like the, te- the teacher failing is really funny. Like they love to see us make a mistake and like absurd sort of things that don't make sense are very funny. So um, I can think of those early creation story, um, nature of the element experiments. And there's some that mostly go wrong. They're actually, they are actually hard to have go right. Like there's one where you put, you take a cup, you fill it with water, you put a piece of paper on top of it, and then you flip it over. And when you do, you have to do it really fast. So it creates a vacuum and the paper is sucked onto the cup. Oh, and you're holding this now half full cup or beaker of water upside down with the paper not falling off. So you can plan for it to go wrong or right. Either way, they think if it goes wrong, it's better. (laughs) The water goes everywhere on the floor. And there's this moment where They're all laughing. They can't believe it happened. They quickly clean up. And then you have their full attention because you're saying like, wait, 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 wait. Like, no, that's not how it was supposed to go. And when you do it again and it goes right, they're so focused on you and the experiment, they get everything they're supposed to get out of like gravity and vacuum and why it worked. And they want to try it and they want to write lab reports and they want to write, make a poster about um, vacuums and gravity. Mm. you've used Uh humor and yourself messing up which is so funny to them to just draw them in well and and you're teaching how to approach failure well there you go (laughs) right I mean because part of our work here is to make sure that we're teaching them how to fall down and what do we do when things don't go exactly right I mean I I have to say I think that's a part of why you know we're seeing such spikes in depression and anxiety in elementary age children starting at the age of five and part of it is is this expectation that life always looks like exactly like this and if it doesn't look like this it's so hard because they they, that's a skill that has to be taught right and and that's such a fun way to teach that I love that's that's great that's great yeah, you're so you're so right when thinking about that experiment. When that water falls on the floor, mm-hmm. they look at you and they're looking at every single like muscle in your face because they don't really know how to read facial expressions yet. They're like just learning how to do it. So even just like you going, "Whoa. Oh my gosh, with a smile on your face." They're like, "Oh, this is not a big deal." Right. You're, to your point, you're just showing them this is how you respond to like to your mistakes. You just go, wow, smile, you know, grab a paper towel, not a big deal. Right. We just, and then we keep, we try again. Yes. Right. We try again. What a great, important life lesson. Love that. Um, okay. So how about any other lessons, examples that you could give with some play infused? Cause I think this is really helpful. These are the like brass tacks of what people can use. Yeah. 
I mean, we grammar, let's do grammar, because I feel like there's this, you know, idea that grammar is the driest, you know, hardest thing to teach because it's so boring, right? Mm -hmm. um, when we, and in Montessori grammar, you're always making these sentence strips in the elementary years. So, you know, strips of the receipt tape with sentences on them that are designed to teach a specific part of speech or um, analyzing sentences. So you're cutting them up, right? It can be really dry and boring if your sentences are really dry and boring, but it can be fun if you, if you create these sentences to make the kids laugh. So in our classroom, we would create sort of this world of what the pets did when we weren't in the classroom. So we had, um, Godzilla was one of our fire-bellied frogs and Lizzie is a bearded dragon. So for example, if you're teaching adverbial extensions like Lizzie and Godzilla ate dinner last night. So there, for them, that sort of very imaginative because they're in that plane of development, imaginative part of their brain is stimulated. They're laughing that how could Lizzie and Godzilla like ever eat dinner at night? You know, they're going, their brains are activated. And then you move into, you know, where's the verb? Cut out the verb. What's the subject? What's the direct object? What's the adverbial extension? And so you've got your grammar, but you had the humor first mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the sense of play first and the idea that the pets could get up in the middle of the night. I mean, all of it's nonsense, but it's what appeals to them. Yeah. Yeah. I completely appreciate that. And and sometimes the sillier, the better mm -hmm. at least. And we have to, of course, also find the things about grammar that we can appreciate. <laughs> it was always a, an area that when I was in the classroom, I had to kind of really muster up my excitement about it anyway. And um, cause they know, of course. So we really, I had to really get present to what I could appreciate about it. It does make it more fun. Mm -hmm. It's a little more work than just looking in your album and using the sentences that you had in your training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It takes a little more time. Yeah. But when you're doing it, you know, as an adult, it feels fun because you're thinking about what they're going to, how they're going to be the next day or later that day when they, when you reveal these sentences and it makes the time go by faster and it doesn't feel like as much work to write these sentence strips. So it's, it's good for us too. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. That's so great. Um, okay. So how do you, and we talked about this a little bit, but you're bringing all this play into your room and you're also holding a space where there's peace and calm and you have a child who's spinning out, right. That, that can't. And oftentimes I find those are, are children who may not have had a Montessori early ed background where they are coming in and they can't, first of all, they're really navigating this newfound freedom, but also the responsibility that comes in the classroom. And I've been in a situation when I was in the classroom where I had somebody who's really spinning. Like it was really hard for them to already to have that level of freedom, like their nervous system, you could see was overwhelmed. And then you bring in the play and the humor and it just, it, it was really hard for him. Can you talk a little bit about, have you had that experience? Yes. And, and you will, though there will be times, I know it sounds like we're sitting here saying like, yeah, just like use play and like, just co-regulate and it will be fine. <laughs> well, it will be mostly fine, but there's still going to be, I can think of a few right now, kids who they just have a really hard time settling down. And that's okay. Mm. You don't have to fix it. You know, it's okay to have that happen, but you can do all the things that you can do for most of the kids to settle down. And then you're it'll be easier for you to be with the one who can't, the one who like, you know, is spinny as you put it, um, it for as long as you need to be. But yeah, like we talked about before, te teaching them and preparing them and getting them used to the feeling of what it feels like to, to be silly and come down. Mm -hmm. um, and then for those who, even with the co-regulation, you know, you're not gonna have the the time or or 
it's not going to work fully. That's what you're predicting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all have, I hope, <laughs> rooms in our class or shelves in our classroom that have some tools for kids to use to calm down. And, mm -hmm. you know, things like the glitter jars. With mm -hmm. the, they shake mm -hmm. the glitter jar, the glitter all settles down. They watch it until it does. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, the mazes, the finger mazes that kids, you know, they can trace and they, they're on nice cold metal books, fidgets. Um, we have all kinds of things. I assume everyone does. You can prepare the child before in the morning, you know, I'm going to tell something funny or we're mm -hmm. going to do something funny. And then afterwards, it's going to be tricky for you to settle down. I know because I get you. Mm -hmm. We've done this before. Go to the glitter jar after. Like, I'm going to wink at you, go to the glitter jar, and then I'll meet you over there. Mm -hmm. You're giving mm -hmm. something to do, something physical to do. Or maybe it's run downstairs after and pick up snack from the kitchen mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, a task that they can do that will just give them something physical to replace just calming down. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then you're teaching them strategies really for every time, every time you feel silly, you can go and you can do this thing. And we've agreed. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they'll start to build the, the muscle. That's the hope to settle down without having to go run an errand or use the glitter jar, but that takes years. <laughs> well, and it's their need to build that muscle whether they're in a playful classroom or not. And the truth is if they are not in a playful classroom, that gets delayed mm -hmm. and knowing how to handle that. I had a little, I had a little guy, my first year teaching Montessori who he was, he was a comedian. <laughs> he was a, he was a second year lower L comedian. And he, but he could take the whole room like, and just, and so what I ended up doing, because children do well if they can, right? And we want to really acknowledge that he had a strength. Mm -hmm. He didn't have a place to put it. So we ended up having Friday afternoons, the last, I don't know, half hour of the day, we had an open mic. Oh, and nice. He had an opportunity to do his comedy. And so everyone had an opportunity. There were only him and then a couple of students, like, you know, would show us how to knit or something but he consistently on friday afternoon he was getting his thing together and he'd get up there and tell some jokes and everybody would just roll around laughing and having the best time and that was really fun and and it gave him then i could say to him too when he kind of was right getting every i'd say oh gosh this is a perfect activity for Friday afternoon. Right now we've got to do whatever we needed to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, that really made a big difference or, you know, a really big difference for him to have a place for all of that and really be honored for it rather than scolded or demoralized. Yeah, that's really good. And that reminds me, um, in a, in a similar, um, similar vein, you, we have a few of those here. They just, that they can completely derail your classroom because all the kids, they have so much social power yes. or you can team up with them, you know? And so let's go back to that science experiment. If you know, they're going to be the one who's like trying to be wackier than you because they want the attention bring them into the lesson with you tell them beforehand here's what we're going to do we're going to do this to the class it's going to be so funny and i need you to help me do it and then they're like right there with you so you get you know you're not fighting against them you're using That's their right. strength they're feeling empowered they're feeling in control they're getting the feedback they need from their peers that like they're they're funny and they're good enough and they're we're honoring them so yeah i love that I love that. I love bringing them in on it. And it also creates that shoulder to shoulder partnership with them where they know, you know, they're behind the curtain a little. And so that's so empowering and what a beautiful way to connect with somebody rather than making them wrong. Because anytime we make the child wrong, we lose them. Yes. And 
the uh, thing I think that guides really and assistance and every needs to know that the students are not just learning playfulness from us. They're learning how we respond when someone's derailing. Yeah. How do you operate in life when someone is taking your group off course? They're watching you for all of these cues. Mm -hmm. Do we, do we, um, poo poo? Do we undermine? Do we shame? Right. All of those things. So that's, I, I love that. I love that. And there's also, I know we don't, we didn't, I haven't really planned to talk about this, but there are different kinds of humor. Like there's aggressive humor, right? Where we're kind of taking somebody out at the knees. There's sarcasm. There's these kind of humors that uh, not all humor is created equal. Yeah. Do you want to speak about that a little? Yeah, I think that's that plays right into like managing the, the classroom and as you, you just said, they're watching us all the time. They see everything. They're looking to us for cues. And there are things that you don't want to be modeling and, and like sarcasm or, or jokes that are at somebody else's expense that we don't necessarily notice that we do as adults, because as a, as adults, we have like a way deeper understanding of humor and we can under, you know, understand and handle sarcasm and sort of dish it out with people we've known for years and it's totally fine, but they can't yet. Mm -hmm. They don't, it's, they're not there. So I think sarcasm, just don't, don't, don't go there. Like yeah. don't say the, the opposite of what you mean in a way that insults somebody. And you can name that, you can teach them just like we teach them vocabulary and for everything else, but this is sarcasm. Here's what it looks like here's the impact it has and when we use it in this classroom let's say to somebody that was sarcastic it hurt like not cool mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and the, the same thing for jokes that are at somebody else's expense you can explain what that is role play it so when it comes up because it will they'll try it out absolutely yeah. especially in upper l they will try it out but you've empowered them then to say to their peer who's using sarcasm with them or using cutting jokes. Hey, that's sarcastic. Yeah. And there's this agreement like, oh yeah, we don't, we don't go there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of that's just being a really good model. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, it's sarcasm and it's aggressive humor. Yeah. Right. And I remember actually going to a couple's workshop and learning about aggressive humor. Mm -hmm. And that was really empowering for our couple and for our family overall to say, oh, that's aggressive humor. That's aggressive humor. We, that's not, it's, it's cheap. It's cheap. Yeah. And it's not something that we're going to engage in. And I love the idea of teaching children that too, because so often at that age, particularly then as they move into adolescent community, that they can go there right? That it's easy for them to, to go there, particularly if they don't have that as a foundation. I mm -hmm. love the idea of giving them, making that a, a, a lesson. Yeah. Right. And, and having that be a part of the conversation in the classroom. Yeah. Has to be. <laughs> has to be. Has yeah. to be. So, okay. So Jody, anything yeah. else that you want to share with us about humor or playfulness before we we wrap up today I mean I think for those who for whom it comes naturally you know it sort of comes naturally um and it's easy to try out if you're if you're a serious person you know yeah. just dip your toe like a little bit like each week just for yourself set some kind of like one day this week I'm going to do something. I'm going to try something and make it really small and like start even maybe with a small group um, and, you know, try it. Mm -hmm. And if that you'll get a hit of dopamine when you do and it, it will, you'll feel nervous, but just go for it. Um, it'll make such a difference uh, in your classroom and make it work for you. Like we're not all sort of playful in the same way. Mm -hmm. so you could start thinking about like, in which ways are you playful? What are you comfortable doing? Is it more like physical? Is it more facial expression? Is it more in the lessons? Is it on the fly? And just, you know, get to know yourself and, and how you are and take advantage of that when you start to plan for playfulness. I love that. Now, would you recommend, 
I always was very transparent with my students in the classroom. Do you recommend that people say, I really want to work on being more playful and, yeah. and own, because then the children get to see that you're also working on building a new skill and I'm going to try this on and you all can tell me how I'm doing, or I'm going to be telling a joke every week, you know, like whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got a handful of kids who don't know at all how to play and do not want to take that risk. So what a better model than, you know, your own teacher saying like, yeah, I'm working on this. Like, come with me, Mr. Serious, you know, <laughs> let's do yeah. it together. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And saying I'm a really serious person, but I think playfulness is really important. So I'm going to be stepping into that as much as I possibly can. And you all can support me in that. Right. And Fantastic. right. And have it be, again, it's like when you take the student and say, we're going to do this together, you're giving a role model for how to do it together. I, I think that that could be really effective. I very much believed in telling, like my students knew that one of my weaknesses was knowing where everything was. And so mm -hmm. I had somebody who like on our jobs chart, one of the jobs was to know where my keys were. One of the jobs was to know where my clipboard with my record keeping was, and they would bring them over to me all day long. They'd be like, you let, I would like, oh, thank you. You know, like, and yeah. so we were, had this partnership going around supporting the areas, which I love because you're teaching them how to support others in their community who don't have all the skills and they get to really, there, there's something very validating and empowering for children knowing they get to support the adult. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, well, Jody, this has been such a fun, <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended really, <laughs> but this has been such a fun conversation. I can't wait to share this with the world. And one of the things that we did not say is that Jody is one of our Greenspring mentors for our elementary community. So if you are new in the elementary guide role, or you um, really want to infuse, you could use support. We've got uh, Biff Mayer, I hope I'm saying his name right, and Jody Trim, power, power, powerhouse team, who's going to be working together in our mentoring communities. And you should join us. It's, it's be there or be square, right? So- yeah. <laughs> um, there will be information about that in our show notes as well. And so Jody, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining us and spending time with us today. Thank you for being a mentor for the center. We are so excited about really providing this expertise and this love of children and the how do we really make it work in a Montessori classroom. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and to our listeners, thank you all for all you are doing to support our community and to support these children. We are doing the work. This is a Montessori revolution. We're so glad you're there with us and we will we'll see you next time. Have a good day.